Hello everyone, welcome back to our Sky Tonight program. Again, this is Seth Mayo, Curator of Astronomy for the Lohman Planetarium. And in this week's episode, we're covering November 16th through November 22nd. And what we'll take a look at is the waxing moon as it glides through our evening sky near some interesting places. We will celebrate the peak of the annual Leonid meteor shower that will be happening early in the week. And we'll take a look at a very interesting opportunity to see the International Space Station and provide some tips for satellite viewing in our sky. So let's take a look. A nice area to pay attention to this week is in the south, southwestern part of the sky. And that's where you find the moon moving nicely through this area. And what you'll start with on the 16th is a very thin crescent right along the horizon. So that may be a little tough to see, but on subsequent nights, it'll get a little bit better as it rises higher and higher up. So if we progress time forward to Tuesday the 17th, you'll find the crescent moon inside Sagittarius, the half man, half horse, who we are saying farewell to in that area. And on Wednesday, on hump day, you'll find that the moon will be near Jupiter and Saturn that are getting closer and closer to each other for that really nice conjunction in December. Following that day, you'll find that on the 19th, and the 20th, the Thursday and Friday, the moon will enter into a very dim but well-known constellation called Capricorn. And once we get to the weekend on Saturday and Sunday, that is when the moon will be a first quarter phase. It'll be half full and inside the constellation called Aquarius. And once the weekend does roll around and we see our half lit moon, the first quarter moon, we'll notice that the moon will be in a very dark region of the sky and some folks like to nickname this the celestial ocean there's not many bright things here it looks like a vast dark ocean of space and the only relatively bright object is a star just south of the moon this one here you may have noticed in the southern sky at this time of the year called Fomalhaut and Fomalhaut is part of a constellation called Pisces Astrinus which is the southern fish the name Fomalhaut is actually Arabic for mouth of the fish or mouth of the whale. And that star really shines, even though it's not one of the brighter stars, it just stands out because it's in a very dark area. Another reason for that nickname, the Celestial Ocean, is because in this area, you find a lot of water-themed constellations. Where we find our half-lit moon by the weekend, that sits inside of Aquarius, the water bearer or the water carrier to the Greeks. And he's supposed to be holding a vase, pouring water through the sky towards Pisces Astrinus, the southern fish where we find the star Fomalhaut, the fish's mouth. Earlier in the week, we noticed that the moon moved through Capricorn. And as you know, Capricorn or Capricornus, the constellation, is known as the sea goat. And next week, the moon will be a little larger in phase and will be inside the constellation Pisces, the fish. Along with those well-known constellations, we can find more to the east, a group of dim stars here that form Cetus, the sea monster, or the whale. And way up in the southwest, pretty high up, you'll find a really teeny tiny constellation called Delphinus, which is Latin for dolphin. So these water-themed constellations really tie into that ocean theme that we find with this very dark, vast ocean of space where the moon moves through this week. Early this week, we get to celebrate the annual peak of the Leonid meteor shower. And normally the Leonids are seen from November 6th to November 30th. This year the peak occurs on the evening of the 16th and really best the morning of the 17th from midnight until sunrise. That is usually prime viewing time for meteor showers anyway, and it's no different for the Leonids, which is named after the great springtime constellation, Leo the Lion, which you can now see is rising in the east in the early morning. And the radiant point for the Leonids actually occurs in the head of this majestic lion. The head looks like a hook shape or a huge backwards question mark. Within that shape, we find that radiant point here. Now again, with radiant points, it's not where you'd see the meteors, but where you can trace many of them back to. So if you watch these streaks of light moving very quickly across the sky, 
you can follow most of them back to about this point inside Leo. And that's what we see with the Leonids. Now, this is not the most active meteor shower of the year. You usually find about 15 meteors per hour. And what's fortunate for this opportunity is that this year the moon will not obscure our view of the Leonids. The moon will already set by the time the peak occurs and that won't add any extra light pollution in the sky. So we can hope for some really good weather and clear conditions for a really good sighting of the Leonids. Occasionally, this meteor shower can produce a ton of meteors, sometimes thousands of meteors per hour. That occurs usually about every 33 years, which coincides with a comet that goes around the sun in about the same time. This is Comet 55P, Temple Tuttle, which was discovered separately uh, in the middle of the 1800s by Ernst Temple and Horace Tuttle. And this small comet leaves a debris field around the sun. And Earth, in November, happens to pass within the debris trail of Temple Tuttle. And every 33 years, we actually hit a very thick part of this debris trail but the last time this happened was in the early 2000s so we're not due for a huge outburst that's going to probably happen by the 2030s but this comet can surprise and it does often produce what are called fireballs these are really big chunks of cometary debris that make these large fiery kind of streaks across the sky that are very noticeable and can have all these interesting colors that follow the streak. So it's a really, really amazing sight to see those fireballs from Leonids. But either way, get out there and spend some time in a dark environment in the early morning of the 17th to catch a Leonid meteor too. One thing that is very surprising for many folks is how many satellites that you can find in the sky. And when we talk about satellites, we're talking about human-made satellites that serve all sorts of purposes. And these are low Earth satellites, for the most part, that are closer to Earth. And if you look in the sky, even for about five minutes, you'd be surprised that you could find at least a few of these machines moving at tremendous speed across the star field. And they're gonna look like bright stars that are moving pretty steadily and pretty quickly because they're moving very fast around the Earth and they don't twinkle or blink. And you usually can notice them or tell the difference between them and an airplane or a star or a planet. They really stand out. So just to give you a sense of how many satellites there are, let's just jump out to low Earth orbit and take a look. Using our Planetarium software Uniview, we can take a look at Earth and turn on many of the satellites that orbit around our planet. And these satellites serve all different functions from navigation satellites, our GPS constellation system, to scientific satellites that study the Earth from afar, to satellites that are used even for our internet that may beam internet across the world, and TV and weather satellites that we rely on every day. And so there are many uses for these devices that have been put in orbit around our planet. And it's amazing how many there are. So if I turn on just some of them at first, you'll see that the low Earth orbit satellites, these orbits you see closest to Earth are the ones you can see with your naked eyes. And there are many of those that are moving very quickly around our planet since they feel much more gravitational tug of the Earth. As we move farther out, we can find many, many more as we turn on all the different satellites that are around us. And you can see the kind of influence we have on space around our planet. Quite amazing to see all of them. One of these satellites is not like the others, and that of course is of the International Space Station that has people on board. We also call this the ISS. And this football field size science laboratory moves around the Earth every 90 minutes. And to do that, it travels at about 17,500 miles per hour. And of course, all sorts of science and experiments are happening aboard the ISS by scientists from around the world, and we're having commercial crews visit the station as well. And it is the third brightest object that you can see from our planet. 
So nothing is as bright as the ISS other than the sun and the moon. There is no star or planet that outshines this space station. It is very reflective, especially those solar panels that draw power from the sun and the other reflective surfaces really shine back towards the earth and can be seen very well. And the reason why I bring that up is because there's a very cool sighting that's coming up this week that we can see that we'll take a look at. Landing back on Earth and looking up into the sky again, this is on the evening of the 18th, just after 6 o'clock, so not long after the sun has set. You can still see a little bit of the sun's light in the west here. And at 6.13 and rising out of the southwest will be the International Space Station. It will move from this area, move across the sky, reach its highest point at about 68 degrees above the horizon, and then set in the northeast and that will take about five minutes and the great thing about Stellarium is you can simulate these sightings if you go down to the bottom of a relatively new version of Stellarium uh, there'll be a satellite tool here it's called satellite hints you can click on that and it'll show you a whole bunch of satellites if you have an internet connection it will load the current orbital trajectory of many of these satellites and so if we speed up time we can get that satellite in view here, the space station. We can already see it rising in the southwest down here. And what's so great is that it's going to be moving past our crescent moon, which we've already talked about, Jupiter and Saturn, and then the space station, looking like a really, really bright, non-twinkling object, will then move into that celestial ocean we already talked about. So all of this relates to what we mentioned earlier. It will move across the sky, and if we follow it, eventually it will set in the northeast and again i'm speeding up time here so this will take actually five minutes but that's not much time to catch this and there'll be a little bit of light from the sun and that's usually the best time to see satellites either in the evening or the morning at least around sunrise when the sun is at a favorable angle to be lighting up these satellites in our sky so stellarium is very useful in showing that to us but you can also use this website here. This is the spot station website provided by NASA. And this is where you can go and look up your zip code or your city and it will tell you the viewing opportunities for the ISS overhead. Of course, we have this set to Daytona Beach where our museum and Loman Planetarium are located. And specifically talking about the November 18th sighting, you see down here it mentions Wednesday, November 18th. It starts at 6.13 and we'll see the ISS for about five minutes. I usually like to really pay attention to the sightings that last for four, five, six minutes long. And it reaches pretty high in the sky, 68 degrees above the horizon at its highest point, and appears 14 degrees above the southwest, and disappears about 15 degrees above the northeast. So it kind of gives you a general area to look at, uh, where it will set, where it will rise, and times and how long you can see it for. So this is a great tool to use. Of course, there's many other websites, apps that you can download for your phone, uh, and Stellarium, again, is a great tool for planning these viewings of ISS or any other satellite as well. So it's a lot of fun. And I've spent many times myself watching the ISS overhead. It never gets old, especially watching it with your family and also to take pictures of it too. So here is a fisheye image I took earlier in the year. This is a streak photo from my front yard and basically I just take a long exposure of the ISS moving overhead and allows you to see the streak of light that we see across the star field. And this was a long crossing for about six minutes. So it was a really good one. And also even taking video of the ISS crossing the moon and the sun. And of course with the sun you have to be careful using the proper equipment, a solar filter, things like that. You have to be safe about it. And there's a website called the ISS Transit Finder that you can use to time these transits of the ISS crossing those two things. Very cool website and you have to be in a very exact position and a very exact time to watch this happen and it will show you a map of where to go. So I've had a chance to do this with the sun, and this was a video I made earlier in the year. I've just turned it into a GIF, so it's looping, of the ISS transiting the sun. You can see the silhouette of the station, which is really cool. This was a very, very fast thing. This is happening in less than a second. 
So you have to really catch it quickly. So that's why video works best. And then also tracking the ISS across the moon. I did this about a month and a half ago, and this is moving very quickly, even though this video is a slowed down version. So it's moving so, so quickly and it's easy to miss, but luckily I captured that as well. And so it's fun to time these things out, to plan these viewings of the ISS, and uh, hopefully you can see the one coming up on the 18th. That's it for another edition of The Sky Tonight. Thanks again for tuning in, and as always, please join us in the Loman Planetarium if you want to watch the show safely and live if you're in Daytona Beach. We hope that you can tune in again as we continue to explore the wonders of the universe. Take care, and happy stargazing.